that's me. So shall I start? So this is the afternoon session and I am supposed to chair this. Uh, uh, Alexandre will give his talk. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll read them after his talk and answer them then. Well, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak here and for putting together such a wonderful workshop. Uh, I also have to apologize to you because my laptop screen is broken. So during the talk, I'm not be able to look right into you. I have to look at an external monitor. So that's the reason it's going to look like I'm not paying attention. <laughs> Sorry for that. So uh, the results I'm going to present to you today were obtained in collaboration with Michal Heller, Michal Spalinski, Victor Svensson, and Ben Withers. And the motivation behind them, in a broad sense, comes from understanding the applicability limits of relativistic hydrodynamics and its reasonable success outside local thermal equilibrium. More specifically, uh, we are interested in finding out whether the elaborated picture that has emerged out of the study of boost invariant expanding systems can be generalized to arbitrary fluid flows. And we are going to explore several aspects of this generalization in, a, in an extremely simplified setting, which is that of linearized hydrodynamics. So the hope here is that we can identify generic features which are essentially due to the uplifting of the symmetry restrictions imposed on the flow and not on nonlinearities. So in particular, I'm going to focus on two questions and each question is going to correspond to a part of this talk. The first question is going to be whether the gradient expansion of the constitutive relations is a convergent series in position space. This is based on uh, this work, this paper here, and it's going to correspond to the first part of the talk. And the second question I want to address is whether the structure of the Bjorken flow trans series is generic. And uh, this is going to correspond to the second part of the talk, and it's going to be based on this recent paper with the authors I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So uh, let me start by defining what do I mean by the gradient expansion of the constitutive relations. So in the Landau frame, uh, we can always decompose the expectation value of our energy momentum tensor into a perfect fluid piece and a non-perfect fluid correction in such a way that the non-perfect fluid correction is transverse, transverse to the fluid velocity which is defined together with the fluid energy density by this Asian value equation here. So we are going to focus on conformal field theories that live in flat space. And for such a conformal field theory, the stress energy tensor is traceless, implying the standard equation of state, and also the tracelessness of the non-perfect fluid piece of the energy momentum tensor. So uh, in this talk, classical hydrodynamics, leaving the conservation equations aside, is going to be the effective field theory defined by the constitutive relations, which express this non-perfect fluid piece of the energy momentum tensor as a gradient expansion in terms of the hydrodynamic fields, energy density and fluid velocity. And in particular, we are going to focus on the study of these constitutive relations in the linearized regime. And what, do I, what I mean by this is that we are going to consider a thermal state. We are going to put ourselves in the rest flame of the fluid and we are going to focus on fluctuations around this thermal state of infinitesimal amplitude. So epsilon in this part of the talk is going to correspond to the fluctuation in the energy density. And this small u is going to correspond to the fluctuation in the fluid velocity. And we take both quantities to be small in a suitably defined sense. So we are going to take into account the transversality condition I mentioned by working directly with purely spatial tensors. And we are going to exploit the rotation group of d minus one dimensional Euclidean space to classify them. So in order to construct the constitutive relations as a gradient expansion, we are going to employ several elementary building blocks. These are these two scalars and this set of two tensors here. And we are going to assemble these blocks into symmetric and trace these two tensors upon which we are going to be allowed to act with an arbitrary number of scalar derivative operators, partial D and the spatial Laplacian. 
And an important point we are going to make use of is that since within the realm of the gradient expansion, it is possible to employ the conservation equations of the energy momentum tensor to replace time derivatives by special ones in a systematic way, we are going to forget altogether about the partial the operator and we are going to consider a purely special formulation of the constitutive relations. This has been previously used at the nonlinear level to construct uh, the gradient expansion of the constitutive relations up to third order in this paper. Okay, so in the end, we find that we have to deal with three elementary tensor structures. The first one is the shear tensor, and the other two are the action of this uh, linear derivative of this derivative operator upon our scalar variables. And we allow it's one of these elementary tensor structures, which are symm symmetric and traces, to be multiplied, be acted upon by a differential operator, which we express as an infinite series in a special Laplacians. So this formulation of the constitutive relations is forced upon you by the symmetries of your problem, by linearity, and the only information about the microscopic theory enters, as usual, into these coefficients, which are scalar functions, which we are going to name transport coefficients. So our focus in this part of the talk is going to be to determine whether the gradient expansion of the constitutive relations defined here is convergent when we evaluate it on a particular solution. So to achieve this, we need to determine uh, what the larger behavior of the transport coefficients is and what the large order behavior of the spatial derivatives is as well. So um, long story short, the transport coefficients can be expressed in terms of the frequencies of the hydrodynamic modes of our microscopic theory, which correspond to the shear mode denoted with a pair and the sound mode denoted with this parallel subindex in terms of the following expressions you can see here. Uh, so the utility of these expressions, which just depend on the norm of the three momentum squared, is that they allow us to link the large order behavior of the transport coefficients to the analyticity properties of the hydrodynamic mode frequencies in the complex momentum plane. So our main working hypothesis in this part of the talk is going to be that the hydrodynamic mode frequencies are analytic at zero momentum, but not entire functions. So uh, these functions, we are going to consider that these functions have at least a complex singularity at a finite distance from the origin in the complex momentum plane. So denoting the singularity, well, denoting the singularity of each one of these pieces with the following notation, it follows that the large order behavior of the transport coefficients as quantified by this object is controlled by these singularities as this formula shows here. Uh, this is shown for the first piece of the gradient expanded constitutive relations, but analogous expressions hold for the others as well. So it's important to state clearly which evidence do we have in favor of this hypothesis. So first, but not foremost, we have theoretical evidence, and it's possible to argue that when the only singularities of the retarded thermal two-point functions of your CFT are posed, you can invoke a paley binner theorem to justify that the hypothesis is a direct consequence of relativistic causality. And secondly, and most importantly, we have empirical evidence, uh, extensive empirical evidence coming from MIS-like theories, ADS-CFT examples, and kinetic theory. So uh, both in MIS and in ADS-CFT, in the ADS-CFT examples known to date, or at least the ADS-CFT examples that I know of, the hydrodynamic mode frequencies present branch point singularities in the complex momentum plane, and the singularity, which is closest to the origin, corresponds to the complex momentum at which the hydrodynamic pole first collides with a non-hydrodynamic one. And as you can, oh, okay, there's a typo here. Okay, as you can see from this reference list, there has been a lot of activity in this, in exploring this subject in the last two years. I also want to point out that in kinetic theory, at least in the relaxation time approximation for the collision kernel, the, this hypothesis also holds true. So the sound, uh, the sound and shear hydrodynamic mode frequencies are not entire functions as well, but the mechanism given rise to their singularities in the complex momentum plane is different from the ads cft one and it's also different between the two channels. And hopefully you will see a note on archive uh, commenting on this soon. So, okay, so after having determined the larger behavior of the transport coefficients, we have to 
and we have to assess the large of the behavior of the spatial derivatives. So for simplicity, and in order to produce a mathematical rigorous statement, we are going to assume that the hydrodynamic fluctuations only depend on the last spatial coordinate, but in an arbitrary way. We are also going to focus on square integrable functions with a well-defined Fourier transform. This is to exclude solutions which may behave as polynomials for which the gradient expansion would truncate at a finite order. And now uh, we are going to imagine that the Fourier transforms of these objects only have support in momentum space up to a maximum momentum. Then we can invoke again a paley binner theorem to argue that in position space, these functions are entire functions of the spatial coordinate of exponential type given by the maximum momentum support. And for any function of this class, it follows that the large sort of behavior of the spatial derivatives is as quantified in this formula here. And in particular, the elementary tensor structures we are employing to build our um, constitutive relations upon uh, are also compactly supported in momentum space. They inherit this property. Uh, the property of com compact support momentum space from the hydrodynamic fluctuations, and thus the large of the behavior of their derivatives behaves like this. So uh, merging the two large results on large order behavior that we have found, we can put forward a general convergence criterion for the gradient expanded constitutive relations when evaluated upon a particular solution. So let us apply the root test to the APs of the gradient expansion. In the end, we get that this piece is going to be convergent as long as the maximum momentum, we are allowing the Fourier transform of, a, of our initial data to be supported at, is smaller than this microscopic critical momentum. So analogous expressions would hold for the B and the C pieces of the gradient expansion. So that in the end, we find out that as long as the support of the initial data is no larger than these quantities determined determined by the microscopic theory, the gradient expansion is going to be convergent. If this condition is violated, we will see a divergent gradient expansion evaluated upon the corresponding solution. So to give you an example of this, I'm going to consider MIS theory, which I'm going to treat as if it were an exact microscopic theory. I'm going to focus on a shared channel fluctuation for which the energy density doesn't change, but the velocity does. And I'm going to consider these particular ansatz. Uh, the only non trivial piece of the gradient expansion is the A piece, the piece with the shear tensor, which reduces to this expression here. And in MIS, it's immediate to compute the microscopic shear hydrodynamic mode frequency in closed form. And therefore, we can obtain the explicit closed form of the transport coefficients we are interested in. So this expression is here. Uh, it's a simple expression in terms of the entropy density, temperature, nth catalan number, diffusion constant, and relaxation time, from which it follows that the critical momentum controlling the convergence of this piece of the gradient expansion is just this. Um, to evaluate the gradient, we need to provide, we still need to provide a given solution. So we choose a solution in which the, the fluctuation of the velocity is initially vanishing, and its first time derivative is just a Gaussian with a cutoff momentum space support. So our analysis predicted that the gradient expansion, when evaluated on the resulting solution, will be convergent if this support is smaller than this quantity and divergent otherwise. And you can check numerically that this happens. And in particular, a point that I want to stress is that uh, if the support of the initial data and the solution because the support is time independent, uh, does not extend to infinity. You get a divergence if you exceed the critical momentum, but it's only, a it's only a geometric one. If you want a factorial divergence, the support has to be unrestricted and unbounded. But in principle, in general, you can get it. So to conclude this first part of the talk, I want to give you a take home message and I want to raise a question. So the take home message is basically what I just said, that unless the initial data are fine-tuned in momentum space, the finite convergence radius of the small momentum expansion of the hydrodynamic mode frequencies translates directly into a divergent hydrodynamic gradient expansion in position space. And the open, the question I want to raise is whether this bears any consequences for the fully nonlinear case. So in the fully nonlinear case, do we have a divergent gradient expansion in position space because of the factorial growth of the number of independent tensor structures 
at each order? Or maybe is the divergence dominated by a few tensor stru structures which are growing themselves factorially? So this would be, uh, I think this would be analogous to the distinction between divergence in perturbative QFT caused by instantons or renomalous. And then, uh, okay, this would conclude the first part of the talk. And now I would move to the second one and I would present a method, a very simple method to construct a trans series representation for a general fluid flow. So, and of course I'm going to do so in the linear response regime, keeping, uh, keeping up with the philosophy of the rest of the talk. So let us consider a particular component of a conserved current with a node by row. And let us, on, on general grounds, we expect that we can write this conserved current component as a Fourier integral in which the Fourier transform can be spectrally decomposed into the modes present in the system. So the main idea here, which is no different from the idea appearing in the original construction of fluid gravity duality, is to introduce a fictitious parameter epsilon by a rescaling of the space and coordinates. And in particular, we allow the rescaling to be not homogeneous between uh, space <clears throat> and time. So if you perform this rescaling within this integral, what you find out is that the qth mode, which we parameterized in terms of this Lipschitz exponent, whose, you know, as k goes to zero, we parameterize the behavior of this mode in terms of this, this Lipschitz exponent set. So if you do the rescaling here, what you find is that the mode at the leading order becomes multiplied by your fictitious rescaling parameter to the set minus alpha, alpha being the factor quantifying this asymmetry. So in particular, we see that a hydrodynamic mode with a Lipschitz exponent set is finite as epsilon goes to zero for the marginal scaling case. And at the same time, non hydrodynamic modes, which by definition have set equals zero, all become non perturbative in the same limit. So the natural expectation is that this procedure transforms this subject into a trend series in epsilon, in which the perturbative sector corresponds to the hydrodynamic mode contribution, and the non perturbative sectors correspond to the non hydrodynamic ones. So I'm going to apply this idea. This is a general idea. I'm going to apply it to a particular setting. And this setting corresponds to the simplest system, which respects relativistic causality and has a hydrodynamic regime, which is nothing but the telegrapher's equation, you can see here. So this equation, it's important for us in the context of this talk because it, it governs shear and channel fluctuations in MIS theory, but it also features in many other contexts across physics, for instance, in systems in the presence of a weakly broken symmetry. So the mode structure of this equation is as simple as it gets. You have one hydrodynamic mode with set equals two diffusive scaling and a non-hydrodynamic mode, mode. So both modes, so there is a critical momentum at which both modes undergo, undergo a collision. So below the critical momentum, they are purely damped. Above the critical momentum, they acquire a propagating component and the damping rate becomes constant. And as the momentum goes to infinity, they become linear in momentum. So this is just a reflection of the fact that at short distances, the telegrapher's equation becomes a wave equation and at large distances becomes the heat equation. So uh, in order to analyze the procedure I outlined at the beginning of this part of the talk, we are going to choose a particular kind of initial data, which is that in which the field vanishes at t equals zero, at t equals zero but it has a non-zero time derivative. And this is just for simplicity reasons. Everything I'm going to say can be generalized to the more general case. So it turns out, and if you want to see the technical details behind the two st the statement I'm going to make now, I encourage you to read the paper. So it turns out that, that after performing the space-time rescaling, we can obtain a closed form expression for the perturbative sector of our trans series in epsilon, which we denote as rho sub epsilon Operates. The operates means that this uh, trans series is controlled, by this trans series sector, this perturbative trans series sector is controlled by the hydrodynamic mode. So it turns out that you can obtain a closed form expression for this object. You know, it's this one here, in which the nth coefficient of the expansion can be written as a expansion in itself in, in spatial Laplacians acting upon a solution of the heat equation, which depends on the initial data. So focusing on the convergence properties of this perturbative series, it's possible to argue that, the asymptot that this asymptotic perturbative series is going to be divergent, 
when the momentum space support of the initial data exceeds the critical momentum over epsilon, uh, in the physical relevant case in which you get rid of epsilon by setting it to one, this is the same condition we obtained before. In particular, when the initial data have unbound, has unbounded space support, we always find that expansion coefficients are factorially divergent. And in this case, it is natural to focus on the Borel transform of this perturbative series, which we are going to take to be a function of set equals epsilon square. And as it is usual, we are going to continue analytically this Borel transform into the complex sect plane or Borel plane by means of body approximants. So in the Bjorken flow, uh, the Borel transform of the perturbative sector of the trans series features an intricate singularity structure in the Borel plane. And both in MIS, like theories, and in ads -CFT, this singularity structure can be understood in terms of the non-hydrodynamic modes evaluated at zero momentum, of course, including their nonlinear interactions. So in our case, we have a single linear, we have a linear theory and we have a single non-hydrodynamic mode. So the natural counterpart of the Bjorken flow behavior would be to find a single branch point in the Borel plane at this location. So to explore whether this is the case for generic initial data, we are going to choose a particular one parameter family of initial data, which is going to be nothing but a Gaussian whose, whose width is given by this S parameter here. And as a technical comment, we are going to focus on an observer sitting at x equals zero, because in this case, we can obtain compact closed form expressions for the expansion coefficients that just are essentially given by hypergeometric functions in a very simple way. So uh, if you, you know, compute the expansion coefficients, compute the Borel transform, analytically continue it into the, com into the complex set plane, and find the um, location of the branch points, what you see is that apart from a normalization factor, the location of these objects is given by a universal function of a scaling variable, which is nothing but time divided over a time scale, which depends on the initial data. And here, you, here in the plots in the bottom, you can see an example of what I just said. So you have two different cases with different S's after performing the rescaling and plotting against the scaling variable this numerical data collapse into a universal curve, which has this form. In particular, uh, the behavior, which is analogous to the, Bjork, to the Bjork and flow one I just mentioned, uh, which is, uh, sorry, which is this one here, only emerges after the critical time. So in particular, if you wish to obtain this behavior for all times, you will need to take the width of the Gaussian to vanish, which is going to reduce the Gaussian to a data function. So your initial data would have to be singular. So uh, it's natural to wonder uh, how can this behavior be explained and obtained independently. So the main idea to explain it is to think of the perturbative trans series sector as a saddle point expansion as epsilon goes to zero of the hydrodynamic mode contribution to the full rho, which we denote as rho h, and is given in terms of this integral here with this particular action. And the important point to realize is that the action depends on the initial data. Now, uh, this action, uh, so, okay, we are going to focus in the case in which x equals zero. So we find that this action has a saddle point at zero momentum with zero action. And the crucial point that we have to realize is that when epsilon is a complex parameter, the steepest descent contour which emanates from the saddle point can cross the branch cuts of the square root that was present in the action and penetrate into the second sheet which is associated to the non-hydrodynamic mode. So once in the second sheet, the steepest descent path. Uh, Alex, please. Can I, can I just warn you that you have used twenty-five minutes, so it's beginning oh. to eat into the discussion session. Already? Yeah. Oh. So can I can I just give this argument and close? Uh, go, yeah, yeah. Just, if possible. Just find find a find a nice way of closing your talk. Okay. Can you give me three minutes? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I mean. I'm, okay. I'm just going to. Okay. So well, what I was saying is basically that the steepest descent path can collide with other non-hydrodynamic saddle points for specific values of the argument of epsilon. And these saddle points are known as adjacent saddles. And the important point for us here is that there is a direct correspondence between the action of the adjacent saddle, the action of the saddle we are expanding around, and the location of the branch point in the Borel plane, which is given by this. So if you look for the saddles in the non-hydrodynamic sheet, you find three of them. One 
always sits at zero momentum and has an action which corresponds to the Bjorken flow, the analogous Bjorken flow behavior. The other two are sitting at finite momentum. So long story short, these saddles start at the critical points of your um, dispersion relation, move along the, the real axis until colliding with each other at the critical time, and then they recede away from one another. So the collision of the of the collision of these finite momentum saddles causes the nature of the adjacent saddle to change. And in particular, uh, before the critical time, these saddles are the only adjacent saddles. So there is only a branch cut in the very plane located here. Past the critical time, the zero momentum saddle becomes a new adjacent saddle. So a new branch cut appears. And since past the critical time, this quantity is smaller than this quantity, the branch point, which is close to the origin, we had determined numerically before, goes from being located here to be located here. And this is the explanation of uh, the behavior I reported. It's, it follows from a saddle point collision, which changes the nature of the adjacent saddle. So I had some assorted comments on this final momentum saddles, which I'm going to skip. And I'm just going to conclude the talk with two points. The first point is that, as I said, for non-singular initial data, the right sort of behavior of the perturbative transserious sector can contain information about the non-hydrodynamic dispersion relations evaluated at final momentum. And I just want to flash you that the underlying that this uh, final momentum saddles imply that your non-hydrodynamic, um, the contribution of your non-hydrodynamic modes to your solution can decay not by dissipation alone, but by propagation. So uh, sorry for taking more than the expected time and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, it's okay. Uh, so we have a couple of questions that uh, are already announced in the in the chat. Um, okay, Travis was, was the first. Travis, why don't you go and ask your Please question? Go ahead. Hey. Hi, so thanks for the talk. Um, I have Hi. one question that's like a yes or no question and then one more conceptual question if that's okay. Okay, great. Um, the first one is that, are, so are you saying, as I understand, I'm just trying to make sure, see if I understand what you were, what you were saying. It's quite a technical talk for me, but okay. um, we're saying that the, the, um, the, the non-hydrodynamic modes will evolve differently than the hydro ones and like in and you're saying that there is some critical action or there's some action that you can use or in given some initial conditions where the non-hydro modes evolve like bjorken like and the critical and the hydro mode evolve so I'm, I, okay so what i'm saying what i'm saying is that the the large sort of behavior of this perturbative sector which is associated to the hydro mode is going to be controlled by the non-hydrodynamic modes right but it's not necessarily going to be controlled by the you know not only the hydrodynamic mode at zero momentum matters, you can also, for initial data, which are more generic than a singular initial data, you can find final momentum contributing. So the rest of the behavior is sensitive to the non-hydrodynamic mode at final momentum. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And this comes through this other point analysis in this linear uh, response regime case. OK. Um, and maybe I'll let other people ask instead of asking my second question then too. No, Thank let's you. go ahead. I mean, I'll go. I'll go. I'll come back to you. Let's ask George. Let's let's George. Can you ask your question first? Yeah. So I actually have three questions. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> uh, so Travis, can you ask yours and then I come to mine? That will be easier. I guess. Yeah. I mean, my question. I'm not sure. It's a kind of a conceptual one because a lot of this went over my head. I'm not going to lie, but um, some of it. Uh, kind of to me seem reminiscent of like a renormalization group type thing when you do the spatial space time rescaling. So I was wondering if that's a deep connection there that I'm making or if I'm completely off base with a with a uh, I don't know. I would like to have a clever answer, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, the rescaling. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe later in the, when we have more time, you have had some time to think about that question. Uh, before I let's take Roche, all take all the rest of the time, let me ask Plas for asking a question. Sure, Plas, go ahead. Plas? Yes, coming up, oh, thanks. Okay. Uh, hi, I was, uh, I wanted to come back to this question of the different saddles. Mm -hmm. And okay. so in four year space, Yes, we know that there there is a single non-hydrodynamic mode that collides with the hydrodynamic mode yes. at non-zero wave vector. So this is where would set the radius of convergence of your of your time model. Absolutely. Yeah. But then you're telling us that in position space, there are actually three non-hydrodynamic saddles yes. that uh, are playing a role. And 
two of them control shorter time dynamics and one which sits at zero momentum controls the late time dynamics. And I'm having trouble reconciling these I two say, pictures. I would say, sorry, I would say it controls the, 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 the convergence of the perturbative series. Right, but in Fourier space, it's there's only one non-high dynamic mode, and that's and, that's and, it. and the yeah, and that's it. That, yeah. that doesn't yeah. seem to be a counterpart to this change of dynamics in Fourier space. No, it's not. It's not. So uh, okay. So from a mathematical perspective, what happens when the saddle point collides, when the saddle, this finite momentum saddles collide, is that you. Your non-perturbative transfer sector undergoes a discontinuous change, right? So, if you imagine that the transition, the critical time is sufficiently large, you would see that it goes from decaying, you know, exponentially to decaying like a Gaussian. So there is a change in the late time behavior under suitable definitions there, given by the saddle point collision. So, so, so yeah, it's possible to have a non-hydrodynamic contribution that decays faster than exponentially in this model. And that's because of the, you know, it's because for a static observer, the decay is not dominated by dissipative effects, but by the propagation of the non-hydrodynamic mode contribution away from it. Which is a, essentially a high momentum effect because at high momentum, the equation becomes like a dissipative wave, you know, a damped wave equation. I don't so know so that all of this I get. It's just that it's kind of counterintuitive to me. Oh, that, it was also counterintuitive to us as well. Yeah, that yeah. the real time picture is somehow richer than the moment and exactly. yeah, than the frequency space one. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's that that overall theme is the main point of the paper that we put forward, which is that uh, you know. Computing the Fourier integral may give rise to these new solid points, which are nothing but let's say coherence effects, right? So giving rise to new new objects you wouldn't expect just by looking at one momentum one momentum mode alone. Yeah. Yeah. Is okay. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds like good good thought for thought and more discussion later on. Uh, George, question number one, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just a comment for the, the thing that Travis said. So in fact. That rescaling does look like uh, what you normally do for the normalization group in, in space time. What you do for stochastic partial differential equations like KPZ and some other things. So maybe it is actually really related. Um, so for the question, so there are two questions for the first one. They are very short questions, the first part of the talk. So the first one, do you have to make a statement that the equations that you're actually dealing with are hyperbolic? So that's the first one. The second one is, did you try when you're doing your linearization to consider other states besides just the local rest frame, for example, some other state where the fluid is, you know, has some constant velocity, but is different than zero. And then the third question is that equation that you have, the, you know, this, uh, this, this nice and little hyperbolic linear equation, you mm -hmm. can actually solve analytically, right? This is, uh, I think you can probably find it more fast, more than Feshbach or something like that. Does that help you at all? I mean, that you can actually have the analytical solution in terms of some, you know, funny ass uh, Basel functions. I mean, could, could you extract all this behavior that you tried to see here directly from the analytical solution itself? Um, well, let me start by the second question. No, we haven't tried. I think it would okay. be interesting, but we haven't done it. Uh, the third question, yeah. We, so a, a nice feature of uh, this particular setting is that you, can, you have access to a closed form expression for the solution of the full problem. And well, as you said, for the initial data that we chose, it's basically a convolution with a kernel in which the kernel is a Bessel function, right? So this, this allows us basically to uh, cross-check the behavior we found by taking different, uh, let's say, approximations with the true behavior of the system. And we have done extensively in the, in the paper. So in that sense, I find it like, you know, just to, it's, it's useful to have this cross check there, but you would expect that, you know, the lessons that you may learn by doing this study can be generalized to other settings in which you don't have this luxury of having an explicit full-fledged complete solution to compare with. And uh, the first question, can you remind me the first question precisely? It's just that um, you made several arguments to, to see what happened. Ah, oh, about the, so you're the talking about the uh, causal model. behavior of the microscopic theory. I'm constructing the mm, gradient expansion for, or you're talking about the mm, effective theory itself? No, it's just that, uh, you know, when you make your general statements, but at some point you try with some 
equations, for example, you try with something that looks like Israel Stewart, that at least linearly is understood that it is hyperbolic. So you can, you know, so how much of that, how much do you need to know? Can I go back to, to that part of the talk? So you're talking about uh, this part of the talk? Yes. Ah, yes. no, this is just to provide an example. So, so the point is, what I said should work for any theory of this kind. For instance, this, this HJSW model should fall into this class. And it should work for, in holography. But this is the theory that just happens to have the simplest non-hydrodynamic sector in which I compute the transport coefficients in closed form. That's it. That's it. OK. I, I could also run the same logic in ADS-CFT, for instance, for a shield channel fluctuation. It's just uh, less immediate because there are several technical steps involved that involve numerics. So does this satisfy your, does this answer your question? Yes, thanks. Great. Sure. Perfect. Plas, you had a different, a second question. Yes, thanks. It, it has to do with the scaling that you do, this epsilon scaling. Oh, sure. So in, in cases where this equation can be shown to arise from a microscopic theory, so for instance, in ADS-CFT, you consider weak momentum relaxation, yeah. then the way you would get this equation out would usually be by taking a scaling limit where you let omega be of the same order as k squared, but also be of the same order as one over tau. And if you didn't do that, if you just took omega of order k squared, then you would just land on the diffusive mode, and that's it. You would entirely miss the, the non-hydro mode. Mm -hmm. So how does this relate to what you're doing? Yeah, OK. Uh... I don't have anything intelligent to say about that. So you're talking about you're talking about that in ADS CFT I can have a regime in which I have a, this parametric separation between a non-hydrodynamic mode and the rest of the non-hydro spectrum, right? Yeah. Let, let, let me put it differently. If you wanted to get this um, uh, this telegrapher's equation that you showed us okay. at some point, okay, then so, you would need all three terms to be roughly of the same magnitude. So for that, you need to take a scaling limit where one over tau is the same order as omega, same order as same order as k squared. Okay. So I can say that uh, this construction would scale all the non-hydrodynamic modes in your system uh, homogeneously, right? They would just take the gap of each one of them to be one over epsilon. You send epsilon to zero. The gap just goes, uh, you know, of each mode goes homogeneously with epsilon. I don't necessarily agree with that. It depends what controls the gaps of the various well, non-hydro modes. They don't need to be that. controlled by the same parameters. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it, OK, you, you can probably, if you want to rescale a microscopic parameter that controls the gap just to isolate one mode, OK? That would be different from doing, you know, obtaining the epsilon expansion by doing this in homogeneous space-time rescaling, right? I mean, if you do a homogeneous space-time rescaling, I think this is what you get. And unless you do something else, like putting epsilon in terms of, you know, inside another microscopic parameter that you can also do. I think that this would just send all the modes to, you know, it would send Let me, let me, uh, in my experience, if you just do the scaling that you show from the full theory, yeah. then you just get the hydrodynamic mode and you completely miss the non-hydro mode. If you, if you want to get the non-hydro mode, then you also need to scale whatever parameter controls the gap of that non-hydro mode. Mm -hmm. And whether it controls one or several doesn't really matter. For instance, for the weekly moment, weekly, weekly relaxing momentum case, you would only get the weekly relaxing momentum mode if you scale the gap appropriately. Okay, I suggest, I suggest because time is moving that uh, maybe you can uh, write something down before we have the general discussion session and, and quickly share it. Then we can pick up that discussion with something to look at uh, after, after the Okay, end. well, why don't I just finish my sentence and then I'll, okay. I'll shut up. So in the ADS2 case that we were looking at in this other paper yeah. you referred to at some point, then the gaps are all of order temperature. Yes. So you get all of the non hydro mode. You don't zoom in on one, you get all of these ion groups. But in any case, you still have to scale whatever parameter controls the gap. And OK, we can keep the rest yeah. of the discussion, which I may not be able to attend, but all right. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't know that. It's fine. Well, okay. It's okay. Thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the questions. All right, I think we should thank uh, Alex very much for this uh, interesting talk that generated a lot of discussion. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. Uh... And then, yes, if you could stop sharing, so.